Our next speaker really needs no introduction, I'm sure. Um, her bio is extremely impressive and well-earned. <clears throat> and I know many of you are familiar with Julie Flygar. For those that aren't, look her up online and see her contributions to the patient advocacy space over the last decade or so. She does have a long bio, and she just asked me to read the first line. So Julie Flygar, JD, is the president and CEO of Project Sleep and the award-winning author of Wide Awake Dreaming. Welcome, Julie. Elizabeth. Hello. Is that good? Okay. Um, well, I get the great honor today of not telling my story. I'm so excited. Um, I'm so sick of my story. <laughs> Uh, and I'm so glad uh, that we have so many amazing stories in our community. Uh, I'm here to convince you that your story is better than mine or we don't have to be in a competition. It's just as amazing and we need more of you sharing your story. Uh, and so to try to convince you, instead of telling you, I hope to show you uh, by sharing one of our speakers uh, sharing her story today. So Elizabeth Terry is a lifelong Hoosier, is that the word? Hoosier, Indiana University graduate, and a recreational therapist. She was diagnosed with narcolepsy while in college in 2015, and then she became a trained speaker through our Rising Voices program in 2018. By sharing her story, she continues to build awareness for this mis misunderstood neurological condition and encourage others to do the same. So I'll share a little bit more about the program after Lizzie shares her story. So please welcome Lizzie. Let's see, can, can we see me over the podium? Maybe not, it's fine, I'm used to that. <laughs> so I'm so excited to be here. Let's see, is this my clicker? The green, okay. And excited to tell you, uh, yeah, my story. Big green. Big, there we go, okay, I'll figure it out. So, how did I go from this very stylish bowl cut that you see in the top left, <laughs> in the pink tank top, uh, to standing here in front of you? I grew up like loving the nature, the nature, nature in the outdoors, playing with my little sister and our fluffy dog Connor. I lived and breathed horses, which started with books and eventually progressed to having my very own pony named Peanut there in the top right. And I also kind of had this mentality of like, the more effort I put into things, like the more I got out of them. And so I ran cross country and was amazed at how the more, the harder I tried in practice, the better I got. But I also did fun things like go on vacation to my aunt and uncle's houseboat. I loved our trips down to the lake, which was a six hour drive. And in a not so movie cliche, I would be looking out the window, gazing, and I'd be feeling drowsy as the miles would start passing by. And I'd start to catch this gray blur in the trees. And when we would get past, a horse would pop out. And I could see the sun on their back I could hear the splash of the rivers that they, we crossed. I could feel their hoofbeats thundering in my chest and delight bubbling up as they bucked and snorted for the sheer joy of it. My personal traveling companions. As a horse crazy kid, I never questioned this as odd or weird, but there were some other things going on that I also didn't ever think to question, like how as I got older, I started having trouble staying awake in classes. And in my AP Calc class senior year, which is the bottom middle picture, do not recommend, wasn't a good time, <laughs> uh, I was starting to fall asleep almost every class. And I enlisted one of my best friends to help me, who was in the plaid in the middle. And one particular class, I had a snack, I had water, I had gum. I dressed up as a nerd during homecoming week, and that still did not seem to do anything for me. And next thing I 
am sitting there thinking that like I could not keep my eyes open. And not for the first or last time, I remember thinking, Lizzie, get it together. Nobody else is this lazy. And I feel a flick on my cheek, and my friend is mouthing, sorry, as my calc teacher is staring me down and says, how nice of you to join us, Miss Terry. Maybe you'd like to get some sleep outside of my class. Let me tell you, I was mortified. I was a high achiever. Like, I had good grades, but being called out just made me feel like I wasn't trying hard enough. Another thing that happened was that, like I said, I ran cross country. And during one of our practices in the winter, it was after a snowstorm. And me and my classmates were running down this road that had like a slope. And all of the snow had drifted into these giant, crunchy piles. We thought it'd be a great idea to run on top of those. And we were all laughing hysterically as we tried to keep our balance running on top of these, when all of a sudden, I suddenly see sink deeper. My legs buckle and I find myself chest deep in a hole. And my laughter kind of dies and I'm just sitting there breathless like watching my teammates get a little farther and I'm like, okay, I, I couldn't pull myself out. After a few seconds, I popped up and instead of really thinking, oh, this is weird, I was more concerned with catching up with them. And I carried that catching up momentum to graduate high school with me to college, where I was so excited to study nursing. And it started off very sweet, like this candy bar that I got from my grandma in a note telling me she thought I could use something sweet and to have a good day. But it was also a little bitter, because I was still struggling to stay awake, and I had a philosophy class where I remember sitting in this lecture hall and my philosophy teachers at a podium not so dissimilar to this droning away the lights are off when all of a sudden he crosses the stage flips the lights on and point blank asks me a question and I can't speak I'm like oh crap and I look down at my notes, hoping something will appear, and they're blank. And I can start to feel everybody's eyes pulling towards me. My heart is like pounding in my chest once again, and everything is too hot. And I'm like, OK. When I look up, maybe I'll have an answer. But when I look up, my professor is back at his podium. The lights are off. Everyone's eyes are glued to their phones or laptops and I don't really understand what was going on. Things were starting to get increasingly difficult to keep up with my commitments. Walking back to my dorm through my gorgeous campus, I returned to the ground level, heave open this door where I was an RA, a resident assistant, in charge of about 25 to 30, can't remember the number, freshmen. And I pause in the breezeway listening to see if anyone was there. And my gaze falls on this bulletin board that I spent hours making, which says, don't come back a zombie. The advice is pinned to the paper boards that I drew with things like, Go to class, be proactive, leave your room. And I heave a sigh. I cross the one dorm to get to my single room and shut the door as quietly as I can. My legs wobble the few steps to this rug, and I melt to the ground, backpack and all. I hear a knock at the door, asking if, I ho if I'm home, and I can't even bring myself to answer it. I pretend I'm not there. I am home, but I'm numb. The rug is soft, and my limbs are 100 pounds, immovable. Who was this zombie board for? It seems like the harder I try, the more I was hiding away and peeling apart. 
my grades are slipping, and I meet with an advisor who gives me an ultimatum. If I want to study nursing, I'm going to have to switch schools. But if I want to stay at IU, I'm going to need to study something else. So if you would have seen me junior year on social media, it looked bright. It looked great. You would have seen me volunteering at a therapeutic horseback riding stable or participating in a dance marathon with my sorority sisters, awake for 18 hours, raising money for a children's hospital. Or in the third picture, at a gala with my fellow resident assistants. I'm the one in the gray dress down in the, let's see, bottom right corner, yeah. Or at a horse show, because I was also on the equestrian team. But what was not pictured was the fact that I realized I'm going to have to do something about this. So I go to the health center where I meet a very kind nurse practitioner. And after we go through the Epworth sleepiness scale, she agrees I am not like a typical 21-year-old. So for the remainder of the semester, I'm doing what I call accommodation Tetris, where I am trying to meet my professors across this giant campus but I couldn't find the words for my teachers to understand or find solutions. A hard time staying awake is mostly met with a sense of, what do you want me to do about it? I finally was able to get a sleep study in December. And then I came back early for my sorority and my job, and I got a phone call. I got the results for my sleep study, which is super exciting. I'm like, we've got answers, great. And I remember being in uh, our school's new music building and being in front of this wall of windows as I'm on the phone with this lady who says, well, we know something's wrong, but we don't know why. It could be anything from epilepsy to narcolepsy to a tumor. And at the mention of that, any excitement I had for my results kind of dropped out from under me, and I'm fumbling through trying to get any information, anything else. She tells me I'm going to have to wait until I can meet with the neurologist. So I weakly thank her and realize that I need to get back to my dorm to take care of the freshmen. I've got too much going on to really worry about this. I finally meet with the neurologist about a month later, and I remember this cold, rainy day, going in alone, sitting in the lobby, going through all the possibilities, and within five minutes of being uh, in the office, my neurologist tells me, it's narcolepsy. And my initial feeling is relief. It's not a brain tumor, great. And my sense is that I'm going to get some medication, and then I'm gonna be back on my busy way. So what is narcolepsy? It's a chronic neurological disorder that impairs the brain's ability to regulate the sleep-wake cycle. It affects one in 2,000 people, or 200,000 Americans, and three million people worldwide. The symptoms of narcolepsy include excessive daytime sleepiness, periods of extreme sleepiness during the day, feeling comparable to how someone without narcolepsy might feel staying awake 48 to 72 hours. So obviously, my episodes in class were all uh, symptoms of that. Cataplexy are the striking sudden episodes of muscle weakness, usually triggered by strong emotions like laughter, exhilaration, surprise, anger. And the severity varies from slackening of the jaw to buckling of your knees and falling down or complete body paralysis. It may be a few seconds to several minutes or longer, but a person remains fully conscious even if they can't speak or open their eyes during the episode. Hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations are visual, auditory, and tactile hallucinations upon falling asleep or waking up, which can be frightening or confusing. In my case, the one in class was definitely that. But my traveling companions 
weren't. So I never thought to question that. Sleep paralysis is the inability, inability to move for a few seconds or minutes upon falling asleep or waking up. It's often accompanied by hallucinations. And it's important to know that people without narcolepsy experience, can experience these and sleep paralysis. In fact, about a third of all people experience these at some point in their lives, usually during periods of high stress or poor sleep. For people with narcolepsy, these are much more frequent and consistent over time. Disrupted nighttime sleep is that, unlike public perception, people with narcolepsy do not sleep all the time. The timing of sleepiness is off with narcolepsy, so one may fight sleepiness during the day and then struggle to sleep at night. There's two forms of narcolepsy, with cataplexy and without. Recent research that we've heard suggests cataplexy is caused by a lack of hypocretin, a neurotransmitter sustaining alertness and regulating your sleep-wake cycle, unless we know is known about narcolepsy without cataplexy. Diagnosis typically includes a 24-hour sleep study with a nighttime portion known as a polysomnogram and a daytime nap portion, the multiple sleep latency test, to record one's brain waves. Diagnosis is mainly based on how quickly and frequently one goes into rapid eye movement or dream REM sleep stage during these tests. It's important to know there's currently no cure for narcolepsy. The treatment for symptoms varies widely from person to person, but includes nighttime and histamine-directed medications to decrease excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy, wake promoters or stimulants to increase alertness, antidepressants, which we've heard about, to decrease cataplexy, and scheduled daytime naps, which most people find refreshing I do, but not everyone. And coping strategies that are very widely from person to person, but that I found particularly uh, helpful have been social and peer support through meetups and groups and on social media, as well as improvements in your general overall wellness. Last we left off with me, I was going back to my busy ways and thought everything would be just smooth sailing. But of course, life did not go exactly to plan. After that meeting with my advisor, I decided to study recreation therapy because I learned there were a lot of out of class components that I was sure would help me be alert and awake. And as I did those, I was starting to fall in love with it. I did amazing things like learn how to play wheelchair basketball at a camp for kids with disabilities. And then my senior year, I had a full-time internship the last semester where I worked at the Indianapolis VA hospital. And the top right picture is of me on an outing with the veterans to a museum. But the farther I got into working these 40 hours a week at the hospital, the worse my symptoms were getting. And I remember writing in my planner at one point, if this could be something I didn't have to focus 75% or more of my waking time on, that would be great. I miss worrying about mundane things. The rest of that semester is kind of a blur. But with a lot of support, I did manage to graduate. And the remainder of my 20s kind of circled around figuring out my medications, my health, being precariously employed, and pinging from job to job. But one bright spot was how, at 24, I was finally able to get back to riding. And I remember one of my first riding lessons being on a horse named Divine, who was there in the bottom right, and hearing the footfalls in this dusty arena, the leather creaking, and the sun shining through little red pricked ears, and finally feeling like, okay, 
Maybe things are going to get better. Maybe I can be myself again. So the future. One upside to all the upheaval that was going on with adjusting to a chronic illness was that I found and leaned into engaging with the narcolepsy community and realized that I didn't actually have any idea how to rest because it had always been something I viewed as getting through or to do later that I rested too much. But being around these people, doing things like going to the Narcolepsy Network Conference in 2018 and going through Rising Voices helped me understand what, that I wasn't alone in the experiences I had and that it was okay to have these experiences. A few years ago, I actually found a rec therapy job working out in the community with disabled people that is extremely flexible and allows me to take care of myself. And what I've come to find is that while I work with people with disabilities, I feel like I've also learned to identify as a disabled person and that I don't have to work harder to overcome or fix the things about me and I don't really want to anymore that I can be happy and sad and need help and also support and love those I care about. And what has been given to me from all of this social support and learning is something that I'm really passionate about giving back to the people I work with. So the picture in the bottom right is an invitation to a, support, a virtual support group that I started through my job to help other caregivers of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to connect and learn how to take care of themselves and also educate them on the importance of rest because it isn't something as widely known in that population. Because of low awareness, even in, among physicians and misperceptions, there's an average eight to 15 year gap between narcolepsy onset and diagnosis. In my case, I probably had symptoms since I was a kid, and it wasn't until I was 21 that I was diagnosed. It's estimated that the majority of people with narcolepsy are currently undiagnosed or misdiagnosed with things like epilepsy, depression, or schizophrenia. And I thank you so much for listening to my story. All right, um, do you have the clicker thing? Yep. yep. So thank you, Lizzie, for sharing your story today. Um, so I just want to share a little bit about the Rising Voices program, try to convince you that your story should be part of it. Uh, this is our leadership team, and I'm really grateful to have Lauren Oglibzi, who is the program manager uh, for this program at Project Sleep. So she now works directly with the participants that take, um, that take this summer training. Uh, I feel like this program was a little bit of like a baby, <laughs> and I somehow found someone so amazing to now lead this program, and I can't believe it, but she's incredible. Um, there's two focuses of the program, to empower the participants, but then also to increase you know, public understanding of narcolepsy and correct misperceptions. I'm a big nerd, too. It's okay. <laughs> um, and there is a ton of research that actually goes behind the program and models from the mental health community especially that we modeled our program after. Uh, that it actually does, in a lot of ways, sharing stories is how you uh, get people un to understand and empathize better than just sharing facts with people. Um, so what is the training? It is a lot of storytelling and health communications best practices. And uh, when you finish, you, are, you, know, you have this 20 to 30 minute presentation weaving your story in with the key sleep disorder facts. So it's a pretty intense program. It's about five weeks over the summer. And just remembering that we have a lot of our graduates here in the room as well. Um, so you can ask them about it as well, uh, their experience. And um, we have now over 150 graduates in 18 countries and counting. So again, some of these great faces are here today. <laughs> So 
so far we have representation in narcolepsy, idiopathic hypersomnia, um, sleep apnea, and this summer we'll have our first uh, participant with REM sleep behavior disorder. So we're really excited to continue to uh, include different conditions in this amazing group. And some of the impact we've had so far, over 101 speaking engagements, uh, over and that, that those people have there's been over 8,500 audience members at those speaking engagements. Uh, they've written 19 published articles, uh, had 31 media interviews, and we've conducted 54 live sharing uh, story sharing sessions with them. Uh, and hopefully, it just continue to grow. Um, yeah. Uh, so we uh, are having the training this summer, and as we prepared for this, we thought, well, we hate to tell them about this opportunity and then be like, well, the application's closed. You can't apply until next year. So um, if you are interested this summer, we've opened the application again uh, for people to apply with IH, and we've printed out a few extra workbooks in hopes that we get a few more of you that might like to participate this summer. Uh, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me or um, email the Rising Voices email or ask Lizzie or some of our other great speakers here. So just last one, um, if you are a trained speaker with Rising Voices, maybe you can stand up really quick. Yay. <laughs> Tara's even on brand wearing the official jacket, <laughs> what you get when you graduate. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>